In this lecture, we want to talk about the apostolic church. And what we mean by that term apostolic is we want to talk about the church as it was in the days of the apostles. Uh, Peter, Paul, James, John, those who were the inheritors of the ministry and the message of Jesus Christ after he ascended to heaven. What we're basically talking about is Christianity up until the year of about 100 A.D. Now, if we're going to talk about apostolic Christianity, it's helpful for us to begin by placing it in a historical environment. Christianity began in the world of the Roman Empire. And at the time, Rome, the Roman Empire was not the only civilization representing what we might call higher culture. I understand that to use that term higher culture or advanced culture, it's a little bit of a loaded term because there were cultures in other parts of the world that certainly existed and people lived and people may have flourished. But we're going to use at least something of this concept of some cultures being more developed technologically and perhaps in a literary and academic sense. Uh, in addition to the Roman Empire, there was also the Persian Empire, there was India, and there was China. Now, we can take a look at the religious environment of those particular higher civilizations on the earth at that time. In Persia, you had Zoroastrianism, an ancient and sort of revered, especially in its day, faith at that time. In India, Hinduism was very strong. But of course, Buddhism had also come five centuries before Christianity, and it as well was flourishing in India. In China, under the Han Dynasty, Confucianism was the state-supported religion, but there was also a strong element of Taoism in China at that time. And then you had the Roman Empire, which actually was home to a variety of religions. And that's what's important for us to understand. The Roman Empire was marked by several religious and philosophical ideas that were joined together in a generally pluralistic system. Now, when we're talking about the Roman Empire, maybe it's good for us just to get a concept of what we're talking about. At the time of the first century, the Roman Empire was basically civilization that surrounded the Mediterranean Sea, almost as if the Mediterranean Sea was something of an island, excuse me, was a lake uh, in the middle of Roman civilization. To put it on a map, you could look at the Roman Empire as being something like this. Up to the very north, you had the region of Britain, the British Isles, at least that which was south of Hadrian's Wall. You had the civilization that was south of the Rhine River and the Danube River, with Roman civilization going quite far to the north, even up to, and a little bit beyond in a few cases, the modern German city of Cologne, or Köln. You had it extending along the Danube River in what today would be modern sections of Romania, Bulgaria, and such. And then you have it coming down into the Macedonian region, following along to the Black Sea. So you had the Roman provinces of Spain, Gaul, Elicria, Macedonia, Asia, Armenia. And then, of course, coming down to the south, you had the regions that are on the continent of Africa, Egypt, Cyrene, Africa, Mauritania. This was an impressive empire, marked by a lot of technology, uh, marked by a lot of education, marked by a lot of trade and transportation. But what we're considering ourselves with mainly here is the religious character of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at this time was marked by several different religious and philosophical ideas. They were joined together in what we might call a generally pluralistic system. There was no attempt to impose a single religion over the entire empire, although later in the empire there was the phenomenon of emperor worship and the need to recognize the deified Roman emperor, but we're going to talk about that later. 
in the Roman Empire of the first century, you could say that, first of all, there were the official religions. These were things such as the ancient Roman cults, uh, you know, the worship of the gods of the Greek, and then what became later the Roman pantheon. But then there was also the worship of the Roman emperor, which was added later. So there were the official sort of Roman religions. But then there were also the philosophies of Greek origin. Included among these would have been uh, Platonism, Stoicism, Epicureanism, the Cynics, Neoplatonism. These things would make up the philosophies that were of Greek origin in the Roman Empire. But then again, we also have the mystery religions from the East. And these were quite popular in the first century, gaining something of a significant following. These mystery religions from the East could come from Egypt, from Syria, from Persia, and they had their own sort of approach to these different things, uh, to the different things of faith and purpose and uh, the unseen and metaphysical realms and all the rest of it. I like the description of a distinguished scholar that you're going to hear me mention several times. His name was Kenneth Scott Laderet. And I'm going to be quoting something from his book, Christianity Through the Ages. But I just want to introduce you to this man, Kenneth Scott Laderet. In some ways, he's my favorite church historian. As a matter of fact, the favorite treatment of church history that I have, that I've personally read, uh, it should be on the shelf right behind me here. Here, here's volume one of a History of Christianity, Beginnings to 1500 by Kenneth Scott Laderet. In my mind, this is the best two-volume treatment of church history. Uh, Kenneth Scott Laderet was a very distinguished uh, historian from a uh, reputation, excuse me, from a university in the United States of America that has a very high reputation, uh, a so-called Ivy League uh, university known as Yale University. The very distinguished, very recognized, and a wonderful believer who also knew how to understand the telling of the Christian story in and through the eyes of faith. Not giving up his role as a legitimate distinguished historian, but also understanding that there's more to understand than maybe just what we might find in um, an archaeologist's discovery. Anyway, Kenneth Scott Lederet, in his book, uh, Christianity Through the Ages, speaks uh, or wrote this about the mystery religions from the East. He said, Every mystery religion centered in a savior God who was supposed to have been slain by his enemies and to have risen from the dead. Some of the mysteries were built around Dionysus, others around Orpheus, and still others around Attis and the great mother who loved him, mourned his death, and effected his resurrection. Some had Adonis, some Osiris, and some Mithra as their center. So these mystery religions from the East certainly had their place in the Roman religious landscape at the time Christianity came to the front. There are some people, and you can find people out on social media and other outlets, who will try to say that Christianity was actually birthed from these mystery religions. And it just took those legends from the mystery religions and reworked them for their own good. What, what these theories discount is the very significant, tremendous differences between Christianity and the mystery religions. Uh, there's no denying that there's some aspects of overlap. As Kenneth Scott Lederet pointed out, uh, these mystery religions often talk about a God that was slain by his enemies. Sometimes they gave emphasis of this God uh, being the son of a distinguished mother. Uh, sometimes they gave great evidence and great thing to the resurrection of this God. The, again, you would find those as points of similarity with the Christian message. But what they discount what they don't take into appreciation is the remarkable number of differences between Christianity and these mystery religions that populated the Roman Empire at the time of the Christian founding. 
that's a lecture for another time. What we're just generally considering ourselves with the fact that in the Roman Empire at that time, you had the official religions, you had the philosophies of Greek origin, you had the mystery religions, and this was part of the world that Christianity came into. Now, the general state of the Roman Empire at the time of Christian uh, beginnings made it in some ways a good place for the gospel to take root and to spread. We as students of history kind of look back on this period and we sort of think, well, yes, I can see why Christianity was successful. There were many elements there that would contribute to a flourishing Christian world. For example, we can just list some of these. Uh, Roman political unity made for peace. Now, this was the peace of conquest, The Roman emperors, beginning with Augustine, they ruled with an iron hand, but they kept the peace. And because there was great peace and stability in the Roman world, again, it was the stability of a dictator, but it was stability. Because there was great stability in the Roman world at that time, there was not constant threat of civil war and the disruptions that civil war brings. The Roman legal system made for order in the world. Now, again, we're not trying to pretend for a moment that it was anything like a perfect or holistic order. There was still a lot of great crime and oppression and all the rest of it. But in a relative sense for the ancient world, there was an established legal system that ensured order. As well, as a third point we will say here, is there was widespread trade across and even beyond the Roman Empire, including the trade of ideas. Listen, where people get together and where they exchange uh, goods, there's also going to be a contact between different civilizations, and this will make for a uh, exchange not only of goods, of things being bought and sold, but it will also uh, contribute to an exchange of ideas. There was as well, at the time, a generally common language. Uh, Now, Latin was spoken, of course, in the eastern, excuse me, in the western part of the empire, but across the empire, especially in the first century, the language of Koine Greek was spoken. That is the language of the New Testament. Now, we call it Koine Greek, which basically means common Greek, to distinguish it from the earlier Greek language that is sometimes called Attic Greek or Classical Greek. But this language of common or Koine Greek was really spoken across the entire Roman Empire. Oh, that's not to say that there weren't a few pockets here and there. But never had there been such a broad area of geography covering so many different nations and cultures and peoples that shared a common language. And that was very good for the spread of the gospel. Then again, you have the fact that the Roman Empire was religiously pluralistic and it was generally tolerant. As Latteret says in Christianity Through the Ages, the time was marked by a search for a faith that would be satisfying intellectually and ethically would give an assurance of immortality. You see, not only was there a general religious pluralism, in general, I'm not trying to say that there weren't exceptions to this, but in general, the Romans didn't care who or what you worshipped as long as it didn't disrupt the public order. But there was also a strong sense in those days of seeking. People had a sense that something or someone was coming, that they were looking for a faith, as Latteret says, that would bring satisfaction to people intellectually and ethically. People were burnt out on the inherent immoralities of Roman religion. And so they were looking for these. And Christianity came at a time when people were looking for something like Christianity, we could say. And then as a uh, additional point, we can say that there were good roads and there was an infrastructure for travel. Now, again, this is connected to the previous idea of trade, But people could get around the Roman Empire, and we see just that happening in the New Testament record. We should also recognize 
that Christianity entered into a distinct historical setting. Um, there's a historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth, or if you wanted to get technical, you could talk about his forerunner, John the Baptist, coming into a very um, recognizable historical setting. For example, we can say that at the time Christianity began, the Roman Empire was young. It was young as an empire. The Roman Republic had been around for a long time, but the Roman Republic was transformed from a republic. Now, we would define the republic as that which is being ruled by laws and being ruled by the Roman Senate. It went from a republic to an empire under the relatively recent reigns of Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus. These were the first Roman emperors. You're talking about something that began just 27 years before Christ, B.C., which actually was a lesser amount of time. Most people accept the figure that Jesus was born about 4 B.C. So in the period between 27 B.C., and A.D. 14, you have the reigns of Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, his nephew. This was the beginning of the Roman Empire. And that was a very significant transition from republic to empire, and Christianity came to a young Roman Empire. We also have the specific region where Christianity was born. It was born in the region of Palestine or Palestinia. That's what the Romans called the biblically named area of Judea. That had been incorporated into the Roman Empire and was ruled as an occupied territory. Thus meaning there was deep resentment, at least on the part of many people, against Roman rule. Now, when we talk about the Roman occupation of what is called uh, in Roman, the Roman world as Palestinia or Palestine, what we would call Judea, it's probably worth to speak about it carefully and precisely. There were probably no Roman troops in Judea in New Testament times. Uh, again, we say this all the time when we're studying the Bible, when we're teaching the Bible. I myself, as a preacher, I talk about the Roman troops, the Roman this, the Roman that. But the nearest Roman legion was camped in Syria. That is to say, there were few, if any, troops of actual Roman blood. You know, actual Roman legions commissioned by the Roman Senate. The Romans carried on the policy of Alexander the Great. That is, that they would hire the armies of the peoples they had conquered. Roman policy and force was maintained in Judea by soldiers who were probably Syrian or Egyptian. Now, it's fair to call them Roman soldiers because they worked for the Roman government, but they were not ethnically Latin. They were not ethnically from Italy or of those Roman legions. No, they were probably Syrian or Egyptian by ethnicity. And there weren't huge numbers of these soldiers. They could probably be numbered in the hundreds in Judea of the first century instead of the thousands. They would enforce the occupation efficiently by being significantly brutal, and by making deals with local leaders. Now, later in the New Testament period, starting maybe around A.D. 50 or so on, uh, continuing Jewish rebellions in Judea forced the Romans to pour in more and more troops into the area, where by the Jewish uprising of the late 60s and early 70s AD, you do have substantial Roman legions in the area, but they were brought into the area by great expense and trouble. If we're talking about this, it's also significant to remind ourselves how Pontius Pilate came to become the prefect of Judea. Now, Pilate's official title was probably prefect. We often call him governor, and that's okay. 
but technically his title was something like prefect. Now, Judea had been an independent client kingdom under the Idumean king Herod the Great. You're familiar with Herod the Great from your own biblical studies. He was the local ruler of the area when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But when Herod the Great died, his son Archelaus inherited his kingdom, which he continued to govern for another six or seven years, again, as a king of Judea, but under the... um, sponsorship, so to speak, of the Roman Empire. But the rule of Archelaus, the son of Herod, proved to be so brutal and so incompetent. You see, his father, Herod, was also brutal, but at least he was efficient. He was effective. That the Jewish subjects of Archelaus appealed to Caesar Augustus in Rome to be made a province of the Roman Empire. If they were made and recognized as a province of the Roman Empire, then Rome would send a ruler from Italy, and that's how Pontius Pilate came to become the prefect of Judea. So, when that happened, again, notice again, the Jewish subjects of Judea appealed to Caesar Augustus in Rome to be made a province of the Roman Empire. So Archelaus was deposed, and Judea was made a second-rank province under a prefect from what the Romans called the Equestrian Order, again being subordinate to the senatorial province of Syria. Pilate was appointed to his post by Tiberius Caesar, and he held his position for about 10 years, from AD 26 to 36. He may not have been popular, but he governed Judea because the Jewish people themselves asked Rome to govern on their behalf. Now, in Roman-occupied Palestine, there were many competing groups in the Jewish community. They would differ on matters of religion and matters of politics. First, we can discuss perhaps what we might call the religious establishment. Uh, These were people who had uh, the general governance of the area, at least from a Jewish perspective, and especially over the temple. This was dominated by the party of the Sadducees. So you have the Sadducees there in the first century. Another prominent party were the Pharisees, who were the spiritual heirs of the movement to keep Judaism pure from the influence of Hellenism, Hellenism being Greek culture. So you have the Sadducees, they were more of the establishment cooperating with the Roman government folks. There were the Pharisees who had their own forms of cooperation, but they wanted to remain more pure from Greek and Hellenistic it's the same way, uh, two ways of saying the same thing, culture, uh, keeping more of a orthodox Jewish culture. And then there were also the minority movements, the ascetic movements, such as the Essenes, who were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. One other thing that's notable to remark about this period, is that there was a real sense of messianic expectation. So much so that when Jesus met the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, she said that she knew the Messiah was coming. John chapter 4 verse 25 says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Now, friends, isn't that fascinating? This Samaritan woman, who properly speaking was not even a Jewish woman, yet she had a very strong sense, the Messiah is coming. Now, I believe that part of this drew upon the ministry of John the Baptist. That was his entire role, was to herald the message, the Messiah is coming, prepare for the Messiah. 
But there were other dynamics and undercurrents in both the spiritual and in the cultural life at that time that gave people, both among the Jews, but also among non-Jewish peoples, the Gentiles at that day, a very strong expectation. They were waiting for a Messiah. Now, all those things put together, and you can say, well, I can see why Christianity was successful. People were ready for a Messiah. There was not a unified Judaism that could oppose Christianity in a unified sense. Uh, There was a widespread trade of ideas. There was a common language. There was a sense of religious toleration and pluralism. There was order given by the Roman government. I could go on and on. And you could say, oh yes, I can figure out why Christianity would succeed. But I just want you to stop for a moment and to say that considered in whole, the success of Christianity is still an incredibly unlikely story. Consider this. It came from a second-rate Roman province, and it went from a being a despised, illegal, persecuted religion to becoming the dominant force of Western civilization and world civilization. Friends, how did that even happen? How is this remarkable story of this group of uh, despised, persecuted uh, people, a relatively small group after Jesus' departure from this earth to heaven, in a second-rate province of the Roman Empire, how did it rise to such prominence in Western civilization and by influence, world civilization? Well, that's the fascinating story of the history of Christianity. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this course, or at least part of the story going up to the period of time that we usually consider to be the Reformation, up to about the year 1500 AD. Now, what we're going to talk about in the rest of our time here together is what we'll call the Apostolic Church. And what are some of the characteristics of the Apostolic Church? Well, the Apostolic Church, again, we're talking about the church when the actual apostles still lived. We're going approximately, we're not talking about hard and fast dates here, but we're talking approximately up to the year 100 AD. Well, what were these characteristics of the Apostolic Church? Well, first of all, I would say you had the authoritative presence of the apostles and the prophets. (laughs) Friends, don't ever forget that. The apostolic church was marked by, and I know it's sort of a a repetition to say this, the apostolic church was marked by the apostles. But you can't uh, sell that short in any way whatsoever. I really appreciate what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 has to say about that. Ephesians 2 20 says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I think that is an extremely important verse giving us a historical perspective for the apostolic church. The church was built on on a foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being a chief cornerstone. You don't need to continually lay a new foundation. You don't need apostles and prophets in the sense that the first century apostles and prophets laid this foundation with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And we have this foundation of the apostles and prophets in our New Testament. Now, of course, we have the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, but that was not the work of the apostles and prophets given to us as a foundation. We have the authoritative writings of the apostles and prophets given to us in the Greek scriptures, in the New Testament, and this gives us, scripturally speaking, the foundation for our Christian faith. What is revealed to us about the person and work of Jesus Christ in and through those authoritative apostolic writings. So don't ever forget that. Don't ever leave that from your consideration. So throughout the first century, we have the making of the New Testament. We have the creation of, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because we believe that all scripture is inspired by God, 
Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we have the creation of the New Testament canon. These books recognized by the church as being inspired by the Holy Spirit in a powerful and significant way. And how did this progress? Well, let me give you some suggested dates of the writing of New Testament books. These are approximations, and you'll find different people with different opinions along these lines. So just take this list for what it's worth. But usually people consider that the book of James or the book of Galatians are numbered among the first writings of the New Testament era. So perhaps maybe the year AD 45, again, that's an approximation, that the epistle of James was written by James, the Lord's brother. Then you have AD 49, Galatians, uh, AD 50 to 51, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians being written during Paul's second missionary journey. Then in 54 and 55, you have the writing of 1st and 2nd Corinthians during the third missionary journey. And no doubt after those two letters, somewhere around the year 55, you have Romans also being written during the third missionary journey. Most people expect that it was during the late 50s or early 60s that the Gospel of Mark was written. And then perhaps around the year 60, you have Paul's short letter to Philemon. Then we have a series of epistles that Paul wrote during his imprisonment that would also include uh, include Philemon that I just mentioned. But we have Colossians, Ephesians, um, written around 60. Uh, probably the Gospel of Luke was written around the same time. Uh, there's reasons to believe that. Maybe 61, uh, the book of Acts, 61, Philippians. Then maybe 62, the letter of 1 Timothy. Then Titus. Then in 63, Paul is imprisoned again, 2 Timothy, then the book of 1 Peter, perhaps. And then coming down again, you have in 63, 64, 2 Peter, sometime in the 60s, Matthew, sometime in the 60s, Hebrews, sometime in the 60s, Jude. And then you have these letters of John written in the late 80s or early 90s. Most people believe the order went something like this, John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, then the book of Revelation, but there's really no way to know this with any kind of certainty. So don't discount this important historical development during the days of the apostolic church. We have that vital Holy Spirit inspired record given to us in the Greek scriptures, what we call today the New Testament. So another thing that characterized the New Testament church, the apostolic church, and again, I just want to clarify, sometimes you'll hear me say the New Testament church, but I'm really not trying to make the apostolic church identical with the New Testament church because we have the history of the New Testament church ending at the book of Acts, basically. But we know that the church continued on, obviously, far beyond the first century, but on continuing in the first century. So I'm going to try to use the phrase apostolic church, but if I say New Testament church, just know that at least in my mind, I'm considering it to be roughly the same thing. A second characteristic of this apostolic church was that you had church life that was glorious and not so glorious. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean that when we look at the New Testament, And look at the historical record. We see a church that is sometimes amazing. Sometimes it is absolutely fantastic. We go, wow, this is like a pinnacle of spirituality. We wish we could go back and experience what they experienced in the time of the apostolic church. And so there was church times that are glorious. For example, in Romans chapter 1, verse 8, when Paul wrote to the Romans and said... First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Was that a wonderful thing to say to any church? (laughs) Your, Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, and I thank God for that. What a beautiful, powerful thing. And of course, there's many such statements in the New Testament that point to us how beautiful, how powerful much of Christianity was in the days of the early church. Let me read to you an extended period here, talking about the apostolic church. 
when Jesus dictated a letter to a leader of the church in Philadelphia. Again, Philadelphia was a real place where there was a real congregation. And even though there is a spiritual understanding of this letter that extends beyond the particular congregation that Jesus spoke to, it was certainly true of that particular congregation that Jesus spoke to. So Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 7, we read, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly, Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now you have to admit, wouldn't you love to belong to the church at Philadelphia when Jesus wrote to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. What a glorious church. Jesus did not have one single word of rebuke or correction for this church in Philadelphia. Instead, he praises them. Even though they have just a little strength, they've kept the word of Jesus. They've not denied his name. Jesus promises them victory. Jesus promises them reward. It's a beautiful, powerful picture of the early church. We say, hooray, church in Philadelphia. However, not every church was as glorious as the church at Philadelphia. Not every church was as glorious as what we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 8, about the uh, condition of the church at Rome. No, church life was glorious in the first century, in the apostolic church, but it was also not so glorious. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and remind yourself that this is written of the apostolic church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says this, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Isn't that startling? That in the apostolic church, even under the general leadership of the Apostle Paul, he had founded the church at Corinth, though he wasn't there when this disgraceful conduct was happening. There was sexual immorality among believers there, and sexual immorality so terrible that they wouldn't even do such thing among the Gentiles. And the church, instead of correcting it, saying these things must not be so among us, They actually complimented one another on being so generous, on being so good, being so loving one to another. Oh no, there were problems in the early church. Let me read to you another extended portion from the book of Revelation. I read to you the portion that talked about the church in Philadelphia and what an amazing church that was. Now let's take a look at Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 22 and take a look at another congregation at that time that was not up to the same spiritual level, to say the least, as the church in Philadelphia. Here we go, the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish that you were cold or hot. 
So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, do you see that section there in Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus was so strong against a corrupt church in apostolic times, the church of the Laodiceans. They were lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. Jesus threatened to remove his presence from them, to vomit them out of his own mouth. They were proud, they were self-sufficient, and Jesus promised to rebuke them. We can't look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, without reminding ourselves that everything was not glorious in the apostolic period of Christianity. Let me read to you one more portion that sort of reflects on this not-so-glorious part of Christianity during the apostolic period. And that'll be Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Paul, writing to the churches of the region of Galatia, says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed." Friends, what a remarkable and sobering statement that is. Again, this great threat of turning away to another gospel, of departing from the essentials of the Christian faith. Look, I just want to emphasize this for you, that often we read the New Testament, we read the book of Acts, we we read other things in the New Testament, and we think, Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to go back to the days of apostolic Christianity? And let me tell you, on balance, I think it would be wonderful. There are many things that we should learn and imitate and gain from apostolic Christianity, but we should not deceive ourselves and think that everything was glorious. No, they had a lot of troubles as well, which they had to deal with by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit from the revelation that God gave them, from the writings of the apostles and prophets, but also they need wisdom from the Holy Spirit to deal with these things. All right, so what we have is we have a New Testament church that's marked by the authoritative presence of the apostles and prophets. We also have a New Testament church, an apostolic church, that was glorious in some ways, and not so glorious in some other ways. Here's a third characteristic that we have. We have a spreading gospel. In a wonderful and profound way, the gospel began to spread across the Roman Empire. In the apostolic period of Christianity, it really didn't expand much beyond the Roman Empire. That would be left for later centuries. But in that first, oh, 70 years, the period of what we call apostolic Christianity, there was a glorious spread throughout the Roman Empire, so much so that Paul could write in Colossians chapter 1 with a bit of exaggeration, you know, just poetic, uh, artistic hyperbole. He said, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you 
as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Did you see what Paul says? They're again using a bit of just, you know, an author's hyperbole. He's saying it's spread in all the world. That's a wonderful compliment, isn't it? They were getting the gospel out. Congregations were being planted all over the place. As Paul would also write in Romans chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, he says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and in deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, I want you to consider something for a moment. That was just the work of the Apostle Paul. Not the work of anybody else, but just the work of Paul. His work alone was responsible for the spread of the gospel from, as he said, from Jerusalem to Elycrium. I want you to think about it. That's a very powerful message. And before the book of Acts is over, Paul has brought the gospel even beyond that to Rome, to Italy. And if you think about it, that's a very broad sphere. We go back to our map of the Roman Empire. Uh, Elycrium is that area north of the Ro- Roman uh, Italian peninsula. Uh, Elycrium would include the modern day Albania and such. And Paul says that he preached the gospel as far as Elycrium. We don't have any record in the book of Acts that tells us that Paul brought the gospel to Elycrium. What it reminds us of is the fact that the book of Acts give us a very incomplete record of the spread of the gospel. First of all, the book of Acts focuses on the work of one man in spreading the gospel around the Roman Empire, and that one man is Paul. Of course, he's the focus of the later chapters. You could say the second half of the book of Acts. But not only is it focused on one man, we we don't know how many other people there were like the Apostle Paul traveling the breadth of the Roman Empire, planting churches and preaching the gospel. Yes, by the end of the book of Acts, not only do we have the record of only one man, but we don't even have a complete record of all that he did. Because he said he went up to Elycrium and we have no record in Acts of Paul going to Elycrium. He must have done it on his off time. Yes, by uh, the end of the first century, you had churches planted all over the Roman Empire. You see these red dots all over the map that's on your screen right now. I think that this is a very conservative estimate of these congregations. I think that there were actually congregations in many more places. But as a conservative estimate, I think that this map is fine. Red dots over much of the Roman Empire. So we have this remarkable spread of the Christian faith. We're going to talk more about that in an upcoming lecture, how the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire. So what are the things we have? I'll go back to the beginning again. We have the authoritative presence of the apostles and the prophets. We have this uh, phenomenon of church life that was glorious and not so glorious. We have the spread of Christianity through the Roman Empire. Number four, I would say that this period of apostolic Christianity was marked by the transition from Christianity as a branch of Judaism to Christianity as a faith on its own, which was not recognized as a legal religion. Uh, Let me just sort of discuss this concept for you. You saw it on the slide before. But in the Roman world, they classified religions under two senses. There was religio licitia. I'm messing up my Latin here. And then there was religio illicita. Of course, religio licitia was uh, recognized, approved of religion. But then you had religio illicita, religion that was illicit, that was unapproved, unpermitted religion. And usually Romans would simply not permit a religion because they thought it was too dangerous to the social order. It's not that they objected so much to what the religion believed, but they would reject a religion because they felt it was too disruptive to the social and political order of their day. 
Now, in the beginnings of apostolic Christianity, Christianity was understood to be a branch of Judaism. You see, Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew. I know I'm telling you nothing new when I make that statement. All the disciples of Jesus were Jewish. Jesus did almost all of his ministry to the Jewish people. Virtually all the followers of Jesus during his earthly ministry were Jewish. There was very little recorded interaction between Jesus and Gentiles. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, he left behind a Jewish church. After all, the 120 people that were gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem on Pentecost were Jewish. Matter of fact, you could say that all of the 3,000 people who were saved on the day of Pentecost were Jewish. None of them were Gentiles. And for the first, oh, we'll estimate six or seven or eight years of Christianity, the church was almost entirely Jewish. However, Jesus clearly said that his gospel should go out to all the earth and that his followers should make disciples of all the nations. So after that six or seven years of almost exclusively a Jewish church, then the church started intentionally bringing the gospel to Gentiles. Now again, at first, the church was all Jewish and no Gentile. Then the church was mostly Jewish and some Gentiles. For some brief time, the church was roughly half Jewish and half Gentile, but soon the church became mostly Gentile with a minority presence of Jews. Now, why was this the case? Well, because there were far more Gentiles in the Roman Empire than there were Jews. They were a minority in the single digits as a percentage of people in the Jewish empire, excuse me, in the Roman empire. Uh, Therefore, there was just much more evangelistic opportunity among the Gentiles. And when the church grew dramatically in the first and second and third centuries, it grew dramatically among the Gentiles, not so dramatically among the Jewish people. Now, the empire reserved the right to declare some religions legal and some religions illegal. If a religion was suspected of subversion or criminal or offensive practices, the Romans might declare it an illicit or illegal religion. Now, Judaism was recognized as a legal religion. And while Christianity was considered to be just a branch of Judaism, it was allowed. But when time went on, And as Judaism distanced itself from Christianity and vice versa, Christianity had to have its own status before the Roman Empire, and it was declared an illicit religion, not allowed, religio illicita. You know, for the most part, Jewish people of the first century were offended that this group of Christians found legal protection under their umbrella. It would be, to make a modern analogy, if all cults were outlawed in a nation, but Christianity was accepted, but groups like Jehovah's Witnesses found legal protection by calling themselves Christians. There might be Christians today that would find that offensive. They would say, well, they're not really Christians. They don't believe the right things. But you could see why, in such a case, Jehovah's Witnesses would want to claim that they were Christians. This break with Judaism was radically deepened after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70. Very few Christians died in that disaster because they remembered the warnings of Jesus in Luke chapter 21, that they should flee to Jerusalem when it was surrounded by armies. Thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of Jewish people horribly died in Jerusalem and in the broader region when the Romans crushed the Jewish revolt in the first century. There are indications that Jews and Christians lived together in peace and cooperation even after that period, especially in the Galilee region. 
Yet the destruction of Jerusalem was a key factor in the growing distance between Christians and Jews. And after AD 70, Christians were not permitted in synagogues. So what do we have? We have these uh, four factors so far. We have the presence of the apostles uh, and prophets, the authoritative presence of apostles and prophets in the first century church. We have church life that was glorious and not so glorious. We have the spread, the expansion of Christianity across the Roman Empire. We have the transition of Christianity from being a branch of Judaism to being something that was not recognized by the Roman government. And then finally, what we have, and I'm just going to make mention of this because we're going to develop it further in a later lecture. We have the beginning of state-sponsored persecution. And again, that's a topic that we're going to address later. Before we leave this lecture, um, let's talk about some of the important people of apostolic times. Um, the apostolic period, well, of course, you would just say that Peter was important. The apostle Peter opened the doors of the Christian church, first to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, then to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, and finally to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. This role, in addition to the promise of the keys made by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, was part of the source for the later exaltation of Peter by the Roman Catholic Church uh, to be the foundation of their idea of papal authority. By the way, Peter is almost always identified in later Christian art as the bearded man with keys. If in a statue or a painting you see a bearded man who has keys, that's Peter. Whatever the nature and extent of Peter's authority was in the apostolic church, I don't find any reference that he was like a pope over the entire church at that time. There is no scriptural or historical evidence that he passed his authority on to any successor. By the way, ancient Christians believed that Peter was the main source of information for the Gospel of Mark. So we have Peter as an example of an important person in the apostolic period. Of course, we have the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul was this most energetic missionary, church planter, and remarkable theologian of that apostolic period, or at least that we know of. And since the 12th century, Paul has often been depicted in art as having a sword. The sword would symbolize both the word of God and the sword of the spirit and the manner of his death. Uh, according to fairly reliable tradition, Paul was executed by beheading of a sword. Then you have thirdly, we would say the apostle John was an important figure in the apostolic church. Uh, he was the last of the apostles to die and he was the last of the long link back to the original teaching and life of Jesus and the earliest Christians. According to Christian tradition, which you might call history, sometimes the line between history and tradition is a little hard to discern, but during the persecution of Christians by the emperor Domitian, he was exiled to a small island, Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. A later Latin legend recounts how Domitian ordered John to be thrown into a vat of boiling oil, but he came out unscathed. Once freed, it is said that he returned to Ephesus to write the Gospels and the three letters that bore his name. But again, these are church traditions. We don't know how much to make of them. Jerome, who was a 4th century church scholar, said that when John was old and feeble, he was carried to Christian gatherings where he gave a single message. He would say this, little children love one another. John was also a tremendous influence on some post-apostolic leaders, such as Polycarp, whom we will discuss in later lectures. And then finally, just in a too brief survey of some important people during the apostolic church period, We'll just mention Luke, the physician. You know, after all, he was the man who wrote more of the New Testament than any other individual. And he had a great influence upon the thinking and the life of the earliest Christians. 
Luke also shows us that there was a significant place for Gentiles, even among the apostles, and in the formation of the New Testament. Now, some people want to ask, and I think it's a valid question, what happened to the 12 apostles? Well, according to church traditions and history, I'll just go through a quick list here. Peter, late traditions speak of him visiting Britain and Gaul. We don't know how much to make of those. But fairly reliable church tradition tell us that he was crucified upside down in Rome during Nero's persecution, somewhere between AD 64 and 68. Andrew is supposed to have preached in Scythia, Asia Minor, and Greece, and he was crucified at Patras in Achaia. James, the son of Zebedee, was executed by Herod Agrippa I. He was the first of the twelve to be martyred, and that's recorded in Acts chapter 12. John, it is said that he ministered at Ephesus and to have rebuked early heretics. It's said that he died a natural death in Ephesus about A.D. 100. Philip is said to have been crucified at Hierapolis in Asia Minor. Matthew, conflicting traditions, plays him in Ethiopia, Parthia, Persia, and Macedonia. Thomas supposedly preached in Babylon. And strong early tradition tells us of his founding of churches and eventually being martyred in India. Bartholomew is supposed to have accompanied Philip to Hierapolis and was martyred after ministry in Armenia. James, the son of Alphaeus, he's often confused with James, the brother of Jesus in early church tradition. Um, he possibly ministered in Syria. Thaddeus, he's often been confused with Jude, the brother of Jesus, because he's also called Jude or Judas, the son of James in Luke chapter 6 and in Acts chapter 1. Tradition associates his ministry with Edessa. And then finally, Simon the Zealot is variously, and we could say dubiously, not very confidently, associated with Persia, Egypt, Carthage, and Britain. Now, I, I want to close this lecture with just a very brief, too brief look at what daily life was like for a believer in apostolic times. What, what was it like to be a Christian in these first hundred years? Well, I would say, first of all, you were very aware of the apostolic foundation of your faith that your faith was connected to the apostles who were connected to Jesus, you would also be very aware of the roots of Christianity, the Jewish roots, I should say, of Christianity. Christianity was still understood to be something very Jewish in its origin. If you were part of the apostolic church, you were part of communities that met primarily in homes. You see, Christians were not permitted to have their own buildings until later in the history of the church. Let me just add, as soon as Christians were able to have their own buildings, they did. Until then, they met primarily in homes. And this would affect the size, practically speaking, of congregations in the Roman Empire. Typically, congregations were just as many as could practically meet in a home, rarely more than 50 people. Therefore, if there were Christians in Ephesus and a large Christian movement in Ephesus, which we read about in Acts chapter 19 and 20, there would be many, perhaps dozens, maybe even more than a hundred uh, house congregations spread throughout the city. In early Christian experience in apostolic times, the Lord's Supper was often celebrated as part of an entire meal, and there would be a great emphasis on reconciliation. In other words, if there was some dispute or disagreement between believers, they would clear it up when they met together and had their agape meal and celebrated the Lord's Supper. At that time of the apostolic church, at least before the conquest of Jerusalem, Jerusalem had a population of about 55,000 people. And there were four to five million Jews who lived outside of Judea. In common life, people would eat two meals a day. And bread was the main food that people ate. And the world had very low ethics and morals. Life was very, very cheap. You know, where individual life is valued and nourished and protected and cherished, often, not always, but often, this is a result of 
Christian influence upon the world. Let me uh, read to you something from a letter that a Roman named Hilarion wrote to Alice. They wrote to them this letter uh, talking about uh, what to do about their children. And this is just a normal letter uh, between family members. This is what they said. They said this, Know that we are still in Alexandria. Do not be anxious. If they really go home, I will remain in Alexandria. I beg and entreat you, take care of the little one. And as soon as we receive our pay, I will send it to you. If by chance you bear a child, if it is a boy, let it be. If it is a girl, cast it out. Just matter-of-factly mention in a letter. If you give birth to a girl, kill her. Get rid of her. Again, this is just normal life in the Roman Empire of the first century and later times as well. Christians were different. They were distinguished by their appreciation of human life, understanding that every life is made in the image of God. So to summarize, in some ways, the period of the apostolic church is the most important period of all, even though we're really going to spend one lecture focusing on it, because it includes the church as it is described in the New Testament. That church was not perfect, but it was guided by and spoken to apostolic authority in a special way that we can and we should learn from. Though it was imperfect, this period provided an essential foundation of spiritual life, integrity, endurance, and love that future generations would benefit from and build upon. There is much for us to learn, much for us to gain from our study of the apostolic church. That's it for this lecture. Join us for the next time when we begin talking about the period that I would call the early church, the church in the early centuries beginning with the second century AD.